My name is Jeffrey Simonoff, and I'm a senior vice president at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, and I lead a program called Workplace Dignity, which we're going to show you a video about very shortly. This is the first in a series of new conversations that we're putting together called Voices of Dignity. Uh, Voices of Dignity is designed to be a, a set of interactive conversations where we focus on specific workplace types, uh, workplace issues, the voices that are driving change as to those workplaces, and some of the issues that are at the forefront of the workers who occupy the spaces that we're talking about. And I really can't think of any workplace type that feels more important right now, especially on the heels of the conversation we just had, than educators, teachers, school staff, administrators, those folks who are on the front lines of investing in our children uh, to make our world a better place. And so we're really happy to be part of this conversation, to focus on some of those issues. Um, again, it's part of an initiative called Workplace Dignity. Um, in a few seconds, I'm gonna show the video that talks about our program, but the core of it is dignity. It's our common denominator. It was, it's what unites us around the world. We are all born equal in dignity, and this program is focused on how that plays out in the workplace. We're gonna do a quick poll um, after the video to get a little bit of a sense of what dignity might mean for you in your own workspace. Um, and then we're gonna have a conversation um, with these amazing educators, which will be followed by a video of the president of the California Federation of Teachers, who is meant to be here. He'll explain why he's not here in the video, because he recorded it this morning. God love him. Um, and then we'll hear from you if we have some time, and if not, we'll be outside during the afternoon to gather some more insights from you all. Thank you for being here. Um, here's the video. Dignity. It is the inherent value and worth of each and every person. It is our common denominator. Bridging our differences, dignity is what unites us. Dignity and human rights do not end when we enter the workplace, where most people spend a third of their lives and derive meaning and a spark of purpose. That's why a workplace centered on dignity is the right and an important commitment to make to employees. Leaders like to say that their people are their single greatest resource, yet the reality is different for so many workers. They feel unseen, unheard, disrespected, and that harms them, their teams, and their entire enterprise. Organizations need to truly invest in people as their most prized asset whatever the work they do, and wherever they do it. When they honor the dignity of employees, organizations are more engaging, more equitable, and ultimately more successful. The RFK Workplace Dignity Program builds on Robert F. Kennedy's legacy of human rights advocacy to offer practical tools for lasting change. We must recognize the full human equality of all of our people. We must do it for the single and fundamental reason that it is the right thing to do. As a leader, you can reimagine the workplace and help move the world forward. So thank you for your attention. I, the, if you're wondering about the voice in the video, the actress Alfre Woodard um, um, helped do the voiceover for us for that video, which we hope that you enjoyed and found some resonance with. And I think it's really important too um, that we're having this conversation during day two of this institute. Um, it's the through portion of the human rights education approach that my colleagues um, advance. And obviously, you can't have conversation about a full school approach and a whole school approach without, without thinking about the people who are working in that environment, which is you all. So having seen the video, um, think about this question. Um, you know, a dignity in your own work environment, what word or words come to your mind? I'm gonna ask you, everyone has a phone, I'm sure. Can you take out your phones? This will be the one time I actually encourage it. <laughs> and I'll give my panelists a break um, because they're gonna be able to talk about it. But the, uh, the, what we'd like you to do is use the QR code. I feel like QR codes are ubiquitous now, right? Um, use the QR code or you can use the website by plugging in that number and it'll give you the chance to type in a word or maybe two words that when you think of what dignity at work means to you, um, you can type that in and then we'll hopefully, through the miracle of technology that Timothy talked about earlier, uh, pull it together 
and see what's front of mind for you. And then we'll go to Lupe and Timothy to talk about their perspectives on dignity at work and what are some of the challenges to it feeling honored, advanced, and protected. So we'll wait till, give you 20 seconds. See, people are still typing. Okay. Let's see what we have. Okay. It worked. Yay, technology. Um, and we have some more, more coming in. But the, the, core, the core sentiments seem to be, um, as we see, respect, support, feeling valued, um, supported. So if you combine those two, I think support would be even more enhanced, appreciated. Many of these things, and you could go to the, our website on the Robert F. Kennedy RFKHumanRights.org website, uh, we have 10 elements of dignity there. Many of those are reflected on the screen. Uh, we'll try to get a, a screenshot for, for you all if you haven't captured it and get it to you, but really appreciate you taking the time to include these really important uh, perspectives. I'm not sure what 758 means, but maybe we can catch up offline about that. Um, ah, it's the code. It's the code, the important code. The, the code makes, it, makes it's, it's itself known. Um, acknowledgement safety is really important. We talk a lot about both physical safety, which was obviously so important. Uh, during COVID and even still, but also psychological safety. What does it mean to work in an environment where you can express your, your point of view, even if it goes against the grain of what others are talking about? So thank you for sharing your voice. I'm gonna turn it now to, um, to our panel. And again, really it's a three-person panel, but the third person will appear in a different way. Um, I'm gonna ask um, Lupe and Timothy to reintroduce themselves very briefly. Um, where are you teaching? What are you teaching? And if you want to just begin with a reflection on what dignity at work means to you as an educator, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? Um, that would be a wonderful way to start. Lupe. Sure. Uh, my name is Lupe Carrasco Cardona, and I teach at the Edward R. Roybal Learning Center in downtown Los Angeles. I teach ethnic studies, the Intro to Ethnic Studies course. I teach Mexican American studies. Um, but in my 23-year career, I've taught everything from, uh, you know, ELA 9 through 12, uh, U.S. history, world history, uh, yearbook, journalism, speech, uh, multicultural literature, so on and so forth. But uh, over the past few years, I've um, been teaching the ethnic studies courses. I forgot theater, which is really relevant to a lot of the conversations here. Um, so... Uh, dignity to me is a lot of the words that were up there, but I really think of, um, you know, like academic freedom. So I think of freedom, right, which is respectful. I think all of us as human beings should be respected as um, intellectuals and thinkers and um, as, you know, folks who have, you know, given ourselves to education, both, you know, going to school, being educated, coming back to our classrooms to continue that um, for our students should be respected as that, as professional intellectuals, not just workers. We are workers, but we're more than that. And I think that is something that has been infringed upon a lot um, in our schools, um, not necessarily by our administrators, but within the system, which you know fits our administrators in there, um, oftentimes results in like infringing upon our academic freedom and dignity. So the idea of being more free to pursue your academic pedagogy, to Correct. communicate the things that are important to you, the lessons and learnings that you've uh, experienced and to bring them forward to your students. Yes. Yeah, amazing. Timothy? Hi, my name is Timothy Stiven, and I've been teaching for, this is going to be my 37th year in education. I started when I was 21, and I'm still going because <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have any other way. Um, I've taught uh, in Los Angeles in a private prep school for 15 years um, and a religious school for three years. And my first half of my career was in the private sector. And then I was public schooled. And so when I wanted to raise my son in San Diego, I came back and I said, I want to do my second half in the public education. Having experience in private schools where you could, honest, you could say, you make up your own rules. Um, and there's a lot of freedom there. Um, but what I wanted to do is when I came back to the public schools, I wanted to take that kind of confidence and say, you know what? 
Um, we're going to do this. And, and so often in, in public schools, it becomes a systemized in, in a sense to say, well, you don't do it. We don't do it that way. And you know what? No, we do. And I have to say, when it comes to dignity, uh, so often we've had our students think about, well, what do you want to study in college? And it was always, you know, business or I want to make money. And what I've been telling them is communications is going to be the major that we're going to have to really master. Uh, so many of the, these uh, majors are going to be taken over by the computers. Uh, I think that dignity is active. I think dignity is going to be the issue where we teach these, these kids how to be dignified. And that means it deals with the gender issues. It means that it deals with the academic freedom because this technology can be used if we're not paying attention. And the only way that we can continue to do our job is that we have to be actively engaged in as we move forward and be able to create the dignity that we find in the students. And I, lastly is, is that if I have dignity, but there's others in this country and the world that do not, then I am not dignified. Right. And it's our ideas that we have to share that in order for us to be really dignified. And I think you know a nuance there too is like, it's actually the case that no matter where you are in the world, you have dignity. We we all inhabit dignity in our lives. We are born with it. The, the real question, I think, in a way, Timothy, around that is, where is a person's dignity or a student's dignity or a teacher's dignity most at risk of being violated, of being trampled upon? And it could be, I think, for you know, if you're, if you're living or working in an oppressive regime, um, the, the likelihood of a dignity violation in your work or your life experience is much more enhanced. It may not be perfect in the United States. It may not be perfect at all in Southern California. Um, but the trick is to find what are sort of the things that push up against someone's dignity, cause it to be degraded, and how can we take steps to reinforce it. And so along those lines, a question I have for you is when you think about whether it's your own experience or your observation of colleagues in your work environment, what are the things that you think about as sort of standing in the way of your or your colleagues dignity at work being advanced and honored and prioritized? What are the things that sort of push against it? And then if I could add sort of like a subpart to that question, how does that affect the learning experiences of your students. Because I think these things are related. The, the work experience of educators and the learning experience of students are not disassociated. So yeah. again, what are the things that sort of push up against dignity feeling like it's being advanced and honored at work? And then how does that affect the student's learning experience? Lupe, maybe you could start with that. So I would say um, I really think that we need to start looking at workplaces and uh, leaders as people who are facilitating pedagogy. So we need more humanizing pedagogy. And that goes to what I was saying with my first question. Um, I, I, myself as an ethnic studies educator, it's not just you know, the content that we teach, right? It's also how we teach it. Mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of the, um, the you know, through human rights. Like I need to model what it is that I want my students to do in the world a better world, right? It's like a little microcosm of the world outside of the classroom. And so um, oftentimes, like in our um, school systems or bigger organizations, we might be saying, you know, dignity or SEL or all these really beautiful things, but we're doing it in a way that's not pedagogically aligned. So I think we need a pedagogical shift. Um, I think the way that, um, you know, administrators are learning how to be leaders, how, um, you know, the CEOs are also, you know, being leaders. I think that that needs to, uh, I, I, I really appreciate the way that it kind of, um, you know, we've gotten really good at, at uh, getting things out, right? Like um, enacting different, um, you know, visions. I like that, but I think that it needs to include pedagogical, right? Because if, if you feel, you know, pushed to have good SEL, right? That's not good for us. How can I, you know, be a great leader if I'm all stressed out because I'm going to be evaluated on how humanizing I am, you know? So it, it really, it's like this, it's this crazy um, pattern that we've seen ourselves get into. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I think that that 
our students, especially like the students that I have in my classrooms, many of them come from Mexico or from like uh, El Salvador or, or Guatemala or the Philippines and other countries that um, you know have some issues in terms of like um, you know uh, interventions that happen in those nations, which result in really you know like poverty and people don't leave home unless you know, like something's really going on there that they have to. And so I need to have the freedom to be able to teach about that because, you know, that goes back to that academic freedom and to pedagogically be supported to do so as an intellectual, as someone who has studied this, someone who I've been, you know, charged as an expert, so I should be able to do that in my classroom. And if I'm not allowed to do so, that can be very stressful because then I know that I'm not educating properly. And then I also know that my, you know, my position is on, in, you know, it's, it could be on the chopping block, right? All these different things that can happen. So ultimately, like all of these things are super interconnected and I need my dignity and my dignity means I need to be able to teach truth in my classroom. And right now we know that teaching truth is in danger, right? There are many states even in California, there are districts that are infringing upon truth. And um, you know, luckily, uh, June 1st, Governor Newsom sent out a letter to superintendents stating that you know, we do not support banning of books. I have been on book banning um, committees, right? Trying to defend books from being banned. Um, it, you know, Newsom, in there, he also talks about not being able to uh, infringe upon you know, multiple perspectives, so on and so forth. And I think that we need to like locally support that so that globally we can show um, that, that we're not gonna stand for that trend to infringe on, on people's dignity and academic freedom. Yeah, great. Um, I think a lot in there, like the idea of feeling supported, um, the effects of not feeling supported, both on your own well-being and mental health and what you deliver back to students. Absolutely. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. It's a high pressure time. It's a great segue. We're gonna go to Tim in a moment. And then after that, we're gonna hear from Jeff because what he's talking about in the video is directly tied to some of what uh, Governor Newsom put out earlier this month and some of the pressure that's occurring. You know, we're in Pride Month. I know San Diego celebrates Pride in July, but we're in a very difficult time for a lot of students, a lot of educators. Jeff's gonna to speak to that. But before we get to that, Timothy, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what do you think are some of the things that stand in the way um, of dignity feeling honored and advanced and how does it affect students if it's, that's the case? Well, again, I agree, everything that you're saying. And I thought, I thought it was two words. I thought of fear and fatigue. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the parents are afraid and they express that afraid in a way in which it's not um, useful for us professionally. Mm -hmm. And then there's that other fear, which is if we do something, we pedagogically do something that is teaching truth, um, that we are afraid that if we do that, that there may be re repercussions. So those two things are barriers. Um, however, uh, the other F word is fatigue, and that is that if we're going to be facing that buffer, that we have to have the strength to be able to, and it sounds uh, uh, combat. It sounds too combative to say to push back. I think it's to stand up um, and not be afraid of that fear, and then also be able to find the inner strength to actually to get past that fatigue. And I think this is an exciting moment right now. I think the technology right now, and in a sense, the the rapprochement of um, almost like pushing for pretending like the civil rights movement didn't happen. Um, I think this is the time in which we actually stand up. And so um, I understand the fatigue and I understand the fear, um, but I'm not afraid. And um, I, you know, the students give me the, the energy. I'm, I really am not afraid of administrators. That's probably a very bad thing to say, because I'm sure they're going to say, fine, we know how, we'll find a way. But I'm not let that bother me. I, what I really want, if the, if the kids are engaged, if there's buy-in, then we can teach truth, mm -hmm. I promise. And it's a great North Star because in any enterprise, whatever the field that we work in, I mean, I'm a former lawyer, I don't do that anymore, but I'm not an educator. But in each of our own spaces of work, you know, there's great motivation with a sense of purpose and mission. Um, and as educators, you know, the mission of the work is around 
the students and learning um, and advancing the next generation and using your voice to speak up and speak out. Um, I think about John Lewis, we were talking about Congressman Lewis earlier, you know, who, who will speak up and who won't speak up and what is the value um, for us finding community with each other, people in this room, um, in the moments of fatigue, we can support each other and help advance the work forward. Um, allies are important in anything that we, we do. And so, and Jeff will talk about that. So let's, let's turn to Jeff for a moment. He'll explain why he's not here. It's been a complicated couple of days, um, but I'm grateful um, that he took the time. So this is a 10 minute video. We'll have a couple minutes following up for some discussion and then we'll be available afterwards. So thanks again for your patience with our tight timing. Good morning, my name is Jeff Freitas. I'm the president of CFT. We're a union of educators and classified professionals. And unfortunately, I am stuck here in Denver um, instead of there with you in San Diego. So th this is a recording, um, but I'll do my best to answer the questions and, and uh, represent CFT and uh, um, uh, really respect your time as well. So I really, wanted to be there this morning and uh, again I'm, I'm sorry but uh weather and airlines and shortage of staffing as you all know in our education system um, is a problem these days um, but with that let me get to this uh, real quickly again um, i'm the president of cft we're a union of educators and classified professionals some of you may be members um, uh, many of you may have heard of us. I've, I'm also a vice president AFT, that's our national affiliate. Um, and as unions, we represent uh, the workers. Uh, in CFT world, we represent uh, workers all throughout the state of California, all types of education workers. Um, at AFT, we represent people outside of the education world as well. Um, AFT, we represent nurses and public employees in many of the states. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure how many states, most, most of, not all 50 states, but most of the states. Um, so it's not just educators outside of California. Inside California, it's all educators, public and private. Um, so uh, this conference, this institute, um, is about uh, human rights and specifically I've been asked to talk about LGBTQIA plus issues, primarily around uh, the staff and how do we safeguard staff. Um, this is Pride Month, so happy Pride Month. Um, I'm sorry I don't have my Pride gear on. This is what I was traveling with and that's all I have, so I have no luggage as well. Um, so uh, let me get down to it. As you all know, maybe you were referenced an article, um, a June 22nd New York Times article about what has been hitting this country more than uh, 300, I think it's over 400 anti-LGBTQ plus uh, uh, incidences and legislation that, that are impacting um, our community and uh, also impacting our schools and our students. And let me just give you a hint of a couple of those. Uh, one, you know, recently a teacher was fired or suspended or potentially fired for showing a Disney movie um, that had a queer character in the, the movie after she had sign off from all parents that uh, Disney movies were okay in their classroom. Uh, a teacher in Georgia fired for reading uh, a welcoming book for students. My Shadow is Purple is the book that she read and some students have blue shadows and some students have pink shadows and some students have purple shadows and she had students write about it and they all appreciated it. But she's been fired because they consider that a divisive book. Um, and those are some of the laws that have been passed um, recently throughout the country uh, that we're fighting back against, the AFT's fighting back against. against. But you know, in California, the laws, we, they're, they're a little better. However, that doesn't mean that the local level, we're not fighting this fight. Uh, a fight that we fought in past Robles, there was a teacher that the students took down her pride flag from her classroom and tried to uh, loosely use the term, desecrate that flag. Um, and they demonstrated this on TikTok. I'm not gonna go into the details, but may, you may have heard of it. And there were some other actions that were taken. The school board, uh, not a supportive school board in Paso Robles at the time, um, uh, took out any reference to trans students and their anti-bullying policy. Um, a horrific step against students in their community. They also started enforcing their policy that every parent must sign a petition, uh, a permission slip 
for uh, any other clubs. They have not done this before. They had it as board, board policy, but they haven't imposed that policy. What they were trying to do is make sure that students who signed up for their GSA clubs um, were getting their parents' permission to be in that club, but they applied it to all clubs, as you can understand. Um, uh, and you've heard about Temecula, and you've heard about Satakoi, but I'm gonna come back to those. What we did and some of the things that we can do and, and, and we do do to help our members, to help the students, because um, let me remind you that the working conditions of our uh, um, educators are the learning conditions of our students. And the converse is true as well. The learning conditions that we fight for for our students often end up being also the working conditions. And in this particular case, when we're trying to represent and protect LGBTQIA plus students, we're also doing that um, for the members as well. There's a, there is a, a smooth connection, a symbiotic relationship there um, where the working conditions and the learning conditions are what we fight for and they're together. Um, what we did in past Robles is part of it is uh, getting better policymakers, and in this case, better school board members. And we had an opportunity to replace four. Uh, we did uh, eventually replace three of those school board members. One of those school board members sent home uh, a mailer talking about grooming and indoctrinating in the very mailer that person is out. Um, we didn't win every election, but we did flip the board because there were already a couple of friendly um, board members, um, people that understood what the community needed, who the community was, um, not just the LGBTQI plus community, but the entire community, the immigrant community, um, the uh, communities of color, um, as well as uh, the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, so that was a success. And one of the things, one of the many things that we do, um, because we have to affect the policymakers, we have to have input on the policymakers. People call that politics. Um, but if you don't have support of those policymakers, as you can see in those other states, you don't get support in the policies that we want. And that's the other part that we do. We, we affect change in policy. Um, we go after, um, we fight for rights, I should say, in our collective bargaining agreements. LA has done an amazing job uh, making sure San Francisco uh, School District or the teachers there have made an amazing job to protect the rights and, and uh, protect the rights of LGBTQI plus communities in their contracts. And that's the policies. At the state level, we're trying to pass bills for education. Um, AB5 is one of them. Rick Zaburr, Assembly Member Rick Zaburr is the author of AB5. CFT is a co-sponsor of this particular bill and it would require one hour of LGBTQI training about resources and cultural competence um, for all educators um, in our schools every year. So uh, I think it's one hour. Uh, as you know, the, the, the sausage is made different ways in, in the capital in Sacramento. Um, and I think it's one hour uh, every year uh, for about five years. There's a, there's a sunset in that. But that's one of the ways that, that we do this in protecting and trying to create a better environment. Um, those resources, um, the, the, the law talks about those resources, that training is for students. But as you can tell, those resources are also for the educators um, uh, that, that, that could help um, in their, their life. Um, I want to go back to one of the, the things that we talked that I talked about earlier. Um, it is June um, and it is Pride Month. Many of our schools are actually out before June. They're out uh, before Memorial Weekend, so they don't get that opportunity to celebrate Pride with their students. But some um, have been able to, and they've passed. We have so many school districts that have passed them amazing. But you did have heard recently about Satakoy school district or elementary school in the LA USD or the LA uh, school district and you heard the response of Jack you may have heard the response of Jackie Goldberg if you haven't uh, look it up uh, she's a school board member she was a previous legislator she's very strong very proud um, and attacked uh, the people that attacked that school Sadako elementary school was um, had a uh, had a pride day and there were uh, people that protested 
against uh, that uh, Pride Day at that elementary school. It's very sad, um, but it's by getting these policymakers on these boards to protect and fight for and to speak up and advocate um, uh, for these students and for the workers. Um, and it, it was an unfortunate event, but uh, you should see that speech if you get a chance. Again, her name is Jackie Goldberg um, at the LA USD School Board. Also, you may have heard about Glendale, um, Glendale School Board, where there was uh, protests outside their school board where they were trying to pass a pride uh, support or pride uh, resolution. I can tell you that one of our members is actually on that board. And that's another thing we do is we try to get our members on these boards and on these school boards or at the legislature so that they can further our advocacy in protecting not only our members, but also the students' rights in education. Um, and that's, uh, that's what we've been doing. I, I appreciate Jeff's leadership um, and that he highlighted different individuals who through their positions mm -hmm. are using their voices to make a difference for communities that need them. So he also later on in that discussion gave some thoughts on some of the things that um, folks can be thinking about to drive improvement in some of these areas, um, developing cultural competence, focusing on allyship, thinking about ways to get active and to participate. Um, obviously, there's a lot of change that's driven through school boards for better or for worse. Um, he talked about Jackie and the, the, the efforts that um, were able to put, be put forward there. So I think there's some great examples there. We only have a few minutes. Um, I just wanted to get um, very brief closing thoughts from Lupe and Timothy, whether reflecting on Jeff's remarks or any of the other broader themes of the learning experience and the work experience and the interconnections. So, and then some folks will be around afterwards, so you can grab us as well. But Lupe, any closing yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you, <laughs> you asked that question because I didn't speak about, you know, like the union work that I do. Um, he mentioned uh, United Teachers Los Angeles, which has been really, really good at fighting um, not just for like what they call the bread and butter issues, but also for social justice. Um, you know, they not only have like the union fought for things like LGBTQ rights and uh, racial and social justice um, and environmental justice, uh, they've brought in uh, stakeholders, they brought in educators and community members to be on the bargaining to ensure that, you know, like PSW voices are heard. Right, so we can bring more PSWs and like um, SPED teachers uh, voices to make sure that we have you know really good representation. So I'm really proud of the work that UTLA has done and being you know one of the largest districts in the country. It's a very important um, model um, to sort of replicate, and it has been across the country. So I think that's something you know to really highlight. And uh, you know, of course, the statewide teachers, CFT, CTA, and NEA, which is the largest union in the country, and it's a union of educators, super powerful. Um, I think that if you're not involved in those spaces, I, you should. Um, I know I, there are some charter school folks here. I know in UTLA, we have some charter schools that are represented um, in UTLA. So we have um, you know, union leaders that are leading that work as well. Uh, it's, it's very powerful because the issues of dignity that we're talking about here, we need to make sure that, you know, um, that it trickles down to our students and then they take it to their universities and they come back to be leaders who are doing this work. Because otherwise, you know, they may just kind of fall back in um, and take those leadership positions and continue to perpetuate the same types of things that we as educators are working against. Great, thank you, Lupe. Thank you for your leadership. And then I belong to a small uh, <clears throat> union, the San Diego Family Association but we're highly ranked in, in Northern San Diego County. And while it might be small, but that's actually a lot of focus is on us because there are forces out there who are trying to find, okay, if they're succeeding, how can we change that? And they have a different agenda than we do. Um, and it means that we do need the unions to be able to be our backbone. Uh, without them, we would be all on our own. Um, but they've been very useful, extremely, from, from, in my perspective, um, getting the COVID tra uh, trauma that we went through. Uh, they were the ones who sit made our faculty safe. Um, and then when it comes to uh, LGBTQ uh, issues, 
that are also been critically important in getting involved. I think it's really important for you to know when the school board meetings are um, and get up there and have the, have the community know that you're interested in. Um, I think that we'll win a lot over, that you are not just someone in this box, but you are a member of the community. You may not live in that community, but you are an integral, important member of that, of that uh, community, and you are respected for that if you come to them. Uh, and then you get to know them, you get to know them. I think it's a really useful point. Um, and then I had the, uh, the pleasure to meet uh, the late John Lewis um, in his office with some of my students. I said, what do you want my students to know? And he said to them, Get, have them get into trouble. Uh, and then he says, Good trouble. Good, but, good trouble. But good trouble. Um, and then I thought about it. The, the end of this academic year, the last day of school, the seniors had a prank, but it wasn't a prank. They had a same sex marriage. Uh, and they just, they all texted each other and they all came out. The entire school, they all left. They all out were in the quad. And then they had one of the students be the efficient and they had that. And that was how school year ended. But it was all the kids doing it on their own. And it was like nothing could be stopped because you know they, they figured it out. Children are our future, and yeah. um, they want their lives to be full and rich and open. Um, and folks in this room are, are helping to make that happen. I'm very grateful for Timothy and for Lupe and for Jeff and for all of you, as well as my colleagues at RFK Human Rights on the Human Rights Education Team, Rebecca in particular. Thank you, and Erica Wynn on my team. Where's Erica? Yeah. Um, she's back there, a, a force behind a lot of this work as well. Thank you, Erica. I just, I, I know we're out of time, but I want to take 90 seconds, one for a last poll, because we want to know how you're feeling and how you're thinking about some of these issues, and then we'll put up some of our contact information. So our, our final poll is going to ask you about how you're feeling about this um, and your dignity at work, um, because I think it's useful for us to have a little bit of data and some benchmarking that we could use in our work going forward. So um, it's anonymous, of course. You can use the QR code again. Let us know what you're thinking so we can drive action from your own perspectives and the reality that you're facing in your work. All right, well, that's, that's helpful. Um, um, I'm comforted that 7% um, are feeling the way that they feel and that it's not higher than that, but even 7% is too much. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. We want to, for this group of workers who are forming the futures of our communities and our societies, it should be at the highest level of uh, dignity advancement, if you will. And we'd love to hear your stories throughout the afternoon if there are perspectives you want to share. Um, and. Our contact information is up on the screen. If it's easier for you to reach out to us by email or through the form that's on the QR code where you can share some of your anecdotes, your stories, or reflections uh, by sharing your points of view with us, um, we can help drive this work forward um, and help represent um, you as contributors, as educators, and as workers whose dignity should be fully honored and always advanced. Thank you so much for taking the time with us.